he's Gagatha Christie out here on a lot of these big end events. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by Underdog Fantasy, Code Mayo. And Underdog Fantasy will get you a deposit match for the first time up to $100. Go do that right now. If you're watching this before Sunday evening, there's still time to get into the $5,000 draw. That's down in the description right now. It takes 15 seconds to fill out. You need an Underdog handle in order to do that, so go sign up for Underdog with Code Mayo, also down in the description. Then boom, get yourself into that 15-second survey. Additionally, if you are watching before Sunday evening, and I know a lot of people aren't, I'll be live with Ben Raza and my guy, Sports Rage, Gabe Morenci, doing our annual bracket pick'em show so please tune into that always leave a rating and review always smash the like always sub to mayo media network and if you want to do a walkthrough for yourself using all the stats and tools that i am using then i highly suggest you go to fantasynational.com slash mayo get yourself 20 percent off a monthly right now will get you all the way through the masters and even into the heritage just a little bit another elevated event which usually the week after a major some of these prize pools and dfs contests are very very high so i would recommend getting that right now so you can use all the tools you can generate your lineups and make life easier on yourself fantasynational.com slash mayo we're talking valspar championship digging into the research it's a full field event it is the final leg of the florida swing obviously sam burns won here back to back years taylor moore won a year ago after adam shank had to try to hit a cross-handed shot next to a tree on the 72nd hole which he couldn't do therefore taylor moore ended up winning spieth made a nice run towards the end last year as well too but Really, what we're looking for here is a great tee to green game. We saw Paul Casey for years have a great amount of success at Copperhead. You know, avoid the water, but it's not one of these waterlogged courses like most of the Florida sing swing that we've seen so far. So a great tee to green game is really what you're going to need. And hopefully, unlike Jason Kokrak, the year that I had a lot of money on him and he could not get it up and down on the final hole in order to at least force the playoff with Paul Casey, got to make a few putts here from time to time. If you can't chip... You you might be shit out of luck. So let's dig in to see what the course is offering up to us this time around. The Innisbrook Resort, the Copperhead course, 7,300 and 40 yards, par 71. And always the distinction was Bermuda, but much like the Players' Championship this year, it is going to be uh, Poa Trivials on top. So it'll be Poa greens this time around five par threes average length 212 yards three of the five actually do play longer than that seven of the holes on this course have a sub 11 percent birdie rate and four of the par threes were a part of that the par fours you got nine of them on the course averaging just a shade over 440 yards uh but there's one really short one 380 yards and that will drag down the average a bit with most of them actually averaging over 445 yards the three toughest holes on this course are all par fours number three number six and number 16 all of which carried a bogey or worse rate over 24 and a half percent over the past few years par fives there are four of them on the course 582 yards a number that's boosted up a little bit by the fifth hole which is 605 these are the four easiest holes on the course and the three shortest ones had a birdie rate that was more than three times the bogey rate so when we're looking at it even adjust when we're adjusting for par being a par 71 copperhead actually plays a little bit longer Longer than the scorecard since there are five par threes com complementing the standard par fours and some of them aren't even really driver holes you're going to be forced to lay up a lot of the time and potentially land on your scrambling as well you have to factor in severe dog legs tree lined fairways 74 bunkers nine holes with water in play and an average driving distance more than 12 yards shorter than the average course again you do have to lay up a little bit here off the tee to get yourself into the proper position like if you can go bombs away with driving accuracy with your driver, you have a huge advantage. That's the Sam Burns strategy. That was the Paul Casey strategy. They just ripped it with their driver and were highly accurate the years that they were going to win. And Sam Burns just made every single putt there was ever to make at this course in his back-to-back -back wins. He was T6 last year as well, in case you were wondering. Driving accuracy, greens and regulation are hit below the PGA Tour average. Essentially, you're just looking for a player who can acutely manage each aspect of their tee to green game, as I alluded to, and just hope they don't putt themselves out of the event. So outside of the par fives, which play 
more difficult than you would think versus like your standard average PGA Tour set of par fives. The entire course is brutal, but the snake pit is where the big blow-ups happen. It's far more noticeable since they're the closing holes, and also because it has that awesome snake pit statue. Everyone talks about, like, the bear trap. The snake pit is way better. Like, you might refer to it as, like, the budget bear trap, but it's not. I prefer the snake pit. I prefer this course to any of the courses during the Florida Swing. It's one of my favorite events of the year. It just, if it had a better PR firm to enhance its image, then all of a sudden we'd be talking about the snake pit a little bit more. But because it's the week after the players, and historically it's been in the spot outside of like one or two seasons, that it just doesn't really draw all that great of a feel because, you know, especially with an elevated event at Bay Hill and then the players' championship, like why would the top names end up coming? We do actually have a, some pretty good names in the field this time around, but overall it's a bit of a weaker field, generally speaking. Uh, one thing I will do with you is do not victory lap anything until your player taps in on 18. I did that with Jason Kokrak. That was a lot of fun. The potential for a multi-shot swing over this final stretch seems inevitable because the snake pit is 16, 17, and 18. They're very difficult holes. You can make birdie. 9% birdie rate, 9% birdie rate, 11% birdie rate. Problem is you have a 25% bogey rate, an 18% bogey rate, a 22% bogey rate, with some doubles or worse in there. Number 16, the biggest, I mean, it's the most difficult hole on the course, uh, the par four, but you know, it has a 6% double or worse rate to go along with the 25% bogey rate. So over 30% of the field is going to make bogey or worse on it. So that's where that really comes into play. The cut line had not been below par dating back to 2003 and then 2022 came around. Conditions were a tad softer. The cut of the top 65 in ties came in at minus two. Um, that was in 2022. So we'll see if that kind of, I don't know, if that will keep itself going throughout the course of 2024. When we take a back, look back to last year and peep the cut line, it was back to two over par. So maybe it was a one-year aberration in 2022 that it was two under. Uh, and if this course wasn't tough enough, Copperhead has the second most three putts inside five feet of any course since 2010, trailing only Riviera if you got tilted at Riv and you got tilted at Pebble Beach, oh, you are for sure going to be tilted again at Copperhead. It also features the lowest birdie or better percentage of any course on the PGA Tour. In If you could play the U.S. Open in Florida in the middle of June without guys having heat stroke, this would be a perfect venue. Grow up the rough and, like, really put an emphasis on hitting the fairway. Some guys, you know, like a Scotty Scheffler, would just go bombs away, and he would actually be amazing at this course, but obviously he is not playing. It's just kind of crazy to think about it that way, uh, where this could be such an awesome course. It's just like having a PGA Championship at PGA National. That sounds like a great idea. It's just the wrong month to start hosting majors in Florida. So let's jump over to fantasynational.com right now to get a sense of what we're dealing with here in terms of the stats. As you can see, the historic cut line, as I mentioned, is right here at two under or two over par. It was two under in 2022, and then everything above par or even after that. Driving accuracy, lower than average. Green regulations, way lower than average. Scrambling a little bit higher. Three putts per round is about even, but most of the three putts come inside of five feet, which is just... Just crazy to think about. The average driving distance, well below, uh, over 10 yards lower. So yeah, 12 yards lower than the average driving distance on the PGA Tour. And like most courses that we'll see, you see a lot of longer irons come into play. A lot of that has to do with the longer par threes, obviously, and the approaches into par fives. Uh, so, but still, the, you know, the plurality is going to come from 175 plus. So uh, emphasis on some of the longer irons irons in the bag, not so much wedges. You know, can you score on the par fives, tread water on the other ones? And then, you know, approach and putting, approach and putting. That's really what it boils down to when we're thinking about who's going to play well at this course. But you can see that you know, off the tee and around the green do factor in a little bit in order not to make some of those egregious numbers, especially like when you need to get it up and down for par, like you gots to do that. And we've seen some pretty low scores at this course over the years. Uh, and again, fantasynational.com slash mayo. The app got kept getting rejected by Apple in the Apple store. Uh, hopefully it's going to be, hopefully it would have been released on like later Saturday, early Sunday. That I do not know. That's a moose thing, not really a me thing. Uh, but he's working very hard on it to get it. I've been using it all weekend. If anyone watched the Cut Sweat show 
obviously it went really well in being able to track everyone. So I really hope that we can get that into your hands as quickly as possible. Taking a look back over the years, I mentioned Taylor Moore won a year ago. Sam Burns won the two years previous, both at minus 17. Obviously, Sammy Burns is in the field again. He beat Davis Riley in a playoff, and then he beat Keegan Bradley the year before that. Neiman was in the mix that year. I vividly remember that because I had bet on Joaquin Neiman. The year before was Paul Casey. The year before that was Paul Casey, but obviously he's on live now. A lot of the guys are actually on live from that year. We take a look at 2019. That was the first year that the players was moved to March. Uh, Casey won at minus eight that year. Uh, so yeah, it's just it's four live guys: Casey, Louis, Kokrak, and Bubba. Bubba had some decent run here, and a lot of it was like chipping and putting related, which was really strange. You know, Rom on live. This this was like the live open. This tournament's really getting hit hard because of live. Uh, but Sungjae was inside the top five that year as well. That was the my Kokrak plus Sungjae year. Poor guy. Poor guy just couldn't get it done. Poor Kokrak. What other years do we have? Maybe we should take a look back at how Taylor Moore ended up getting the job done a year ago and see if that can really match up with anything that we've seen or at least trying to predict out. We see across the board, he gained, didn't have to gain all that much around the greens, but he did gain five strokes putting, five strokes on approach, and gained off the tee. Shank, Fleetwood, Spieth, and Windy C. We'll see if he wins the Players' Championship. Obviously, I do not know that yet. Obviously, I am rooting for Brian Harmon to win because I have money on Brian Harmon. JT was right around it. He just couldn't make any putts coming home. And if you're not going to gain, you see, like, the top five finishers all gained at least 1.7 strokes putting, and that was by far the lowest. If you just take the top seven here in the Gribbler, Cody Gribble, who led four strokes around the green. He gained 6.5. So Burns was the worst of outside of Wyndham Clark of anyone inside the top seven finishers with only three strokes gained. Outside of that, 3.6, 4.6, 7.4, 4.9, 6.5. So if you're not running a hot putter, chances are it's not going to go well for you coming into this event. If we go to a select view, we can kind of see like greens and regulations and fairways, uh, good drives gained. I mean, everyone inside the top 10 gained on good drives gained versus the field. See, most of the people gained on driving distance. So it's not like you can't have driving distance. It's just you need to be able to do better than the field in that greens and regu regulation game. You'd have to go down to T16 to find the first guy who lost against the field. But that would kind of coincide almost identically with good drives gained. If you're unfamiliar with good drives gained, um, it's you know basically just driving greens regulation <laughs> uh, when you go into it. If you're ever wondering what any of the tools are, you can easily go into the glossary of stats and we can find out what everything is. Good drives gained or good drives are when the player either hits the ball, either hits the fairway off the tee or the player misses the fairway, but still hits the green or fringe in regulation. So if you hit the fairway, that's a good drive. If you miss the fairway, but still hit a green in regulation, that is still considered a good drive that you still drove it into a spot where you were able to get it onto the green. So it's sort of like enhanced driving accuracy. It's actually a stat I really like that very few actually talk about. People are always like, oh, you need to have that guy that is you know, great proximity from the edge of the green. Like, no, you really don't at some courses because some guys know where they can miss it. And that's where good drives gain, like Keegan Bradley, the king of good drives gained over the years. So that's how Taylor Moore ended up getting it done a year ago. We go back to tournament history and we'll take a look at how Sam Burns was able to do it in 2022. Now again, this year played a little bit softer and apparently Davis Riley was like a thing that year. Couldn't hit an approach to save his life. Only guy inside the top 12 who lost strokes on approach, but he gained 5.1 around the greens and 7.1 on the greens. Burns actually dropped strokes off the tee. The only guy inside the top 16 to do that became seven on approach. I guess this wasn't the Neiman year. Neiman year must have been the year before that in 2000. Yeah, it was 2021. So Thomas was top five. Harmon was top five. Harmon's back in the field this time around. He gained 7.6 strokes putting. I would actually think a lot of the players that did really well on the greens at Sawgrass this week would probably be a pretty decent look this year. Burns was the first round leader with a 64, and he, all of his rounds were in the 60s. Uh, he lost strokes off the tee, only guy inside the top 15 to do that. The year previous to that, Sam Burns ended up being three strokes clear of Keegan Bradley. He shot a 63 on Friday, and that was you know, the, the best round of the tournament, and that was good enough. So you see some names pop up here, like Matthew Neesmith. See how Neesmith's been doing, because he's having a pretty decent run at the Players' Championship through three rounds as we speak. It's been a very rough year. It's funny that you get to the Players' Championship in what has been the largest and best field so far on the PGA Tour in 2024. And that, 
all of a sudden is when he actually wants to show up and do something. So maybe as a first round leader, you could potentially give him a look. One thing I want to do that I always forget to do going into this tournament is just take a look at some of the recent form of the winners and how they actually were doing before coming into this event. So I know that Feinberg hit Taylor Moore last year. This was when he got onto the board. So, you know, hopefully we can we can pile up two here before Jeff gets to one if Brian Harmon can do us a solid. So we saw two really good approach performances. There wasn't really much going on. He had kind of made every cut coming through. But in Phoenix, four strokes gained on approach at the Genesis 6.3. Anyway, that's this year. What the hell am I talking about? He's having a good run right now. Uh, let's go back and look at the Valspar last year. So he made the cut of the players and gained four strokes on approach and gained off the tee. He had been gaining off the tee pretty significantly everywhere. At the API, 3.7, 3.4 in Phoenix. And he had top 15 finishes through the West Coast swing after starting the year off pretty terrible. The first event that he had played was the American Express. Then he goes to Farmers, Pebble, and Phoenix and comes top 15 in all of them before kind of going backwards a little gained off the tee and on approach in all those events and then did that at the players championship so a t35 at the players for taylor moore okay so that's interesting information to have uh let's go back and look at what sam burns was up to I mean, apparently i have cap locks on with this code mayo at underdog fantasy by the way in case you didn't know so we'll go to 2022 when he was the champ he won the charles schwab and he won the valspar so he was ninth at the arnold palmer invitational and 26th at the player so so far we have two guys who finished top 35 at the players championship you can see that he was ramping up he had gained the worst he did over that stretch was gained 4.4 strokes on putting and that was at the Players Championship when he came T26. Uh, the approach was good at Arnold Palmer. The approach was really good at Valspar. Gained off the tee marginally at the Players and at the Arnold Palmer. It was like kind of terrible through the West Coast swing. Uh, he had one decent approach week, decent chipping. The putter was bad. The driver was bad everywhere besides Farmers. But he missed the three straight cuts coming in. Got it back together a little bit during the Florida swing. So let's see how he did that the year before. It was in May. The year before that, because with the COVID reshuffling, uh, that's just how everything ended up turning out. So this year is a bit of a different outlier, but his approach game had been fire coming in. You can just see, you know, even dating back to the swing season, 6.5, turns the new year, 2.1, 1.2, 1.5, 6.8 with a third place finish. Uh, he had missed the cut at the players that year, but that wasn't the year that it was after the players. Uh, at the Heritage, he's T39, then he wins the Valspar, and then he goes out again and comes second at the Byron Nelson, ends up winning uh, at the Sanderson Farms during the swing season and loses in the playoff when Abraham Answer got his first win at Southwind. So uh, good approach performance coming up to it. Nothing great, again, but he was able to flip the switch getting back to Florida, and he had a, you know, a bad run through Florida for like the first time ever in his career. So before that would have been Paul Casey. See if uh, what he was up to. Paul, Paul Casey. The live guys are still in the system at the moment, I think. There we go. There's Paul Casey. Let's see how Paul Casey's doing here. Uh, we'll go to his wins. We had the Valspar Championship. He had missed the cut at the players. That's when everyone was on him. He was uber chalk at the players that year in 2019. Ended up missing the cut because I think he went double water on 17. And that was the end of him. That's him. But he still gained strokes on a pro. On, uh, driving the ball, actually. And his approach play had been amazing going into it. He had a 16th at the TOC. He had gained strokes on approach at the Sony but missed the cut because he dropped 3.1 on the greens second at the AT&T Pro-Am that's the year that Phil won uh, and he gained strokes on approach in the two rounds so a stroke per round on approach at Pebble Beach the Genesis gained four off the tee six around the green lost five on the greens but still managed to gain strokes on approach T25 WGC Mexico gained six, gained almost six strokes between driving and approach before missing the cut at the players and then winning. Okay. So we're seeing like a little bit of, you know, you need to have some form with approach coming in. Um, obviously uh, here, here he came T12 uh, before playing the Valspar championship. This is when the players championship was still in May. This is 2018. So we're going back a while here, but you can see T to green. He had been just, you know, kind of killing it coming in and you hope that the putter flips a little bit. He had not only, and it's funny because he lost strokes off the tee at the Valspar, but game, I mean, marginally, but gained 9.5 four strokes tee to green he had gained every start uh, on the pga tour that season tee to green coming in only the genesis was like a little bit bad but he had some good form coming in so we do want to see some form from some of our players coming in this week overall like i said it's actually a pretty strong field if we just kind of 
sort by strokes gain total over the last 24 rounds, you will see the, the best in the field are Justin Thomas, Sam Burns, Xander, Killa Keith, the Gim Reaper, Bo Hostler, Ryu, Horschel, Bez, Taylor Pendrith, Tony Fino. This could be a very nice Tony course. Can't really recall whether or not Tony is actually gaining strokes on the green or not, but I know he's not like the worst guy in the field on the greens this week, which he had been kind of going in to it. Yeah, he's actually up through three rounds, 2.3 strokes putting. So this might be a really good time to get back on Tony Fina, the best player in the field in approach over the past 24 rounds, third tee to green. And we'll just take a look at it. Like, it's one of the reasons why I was on him at the players, just like maybe he can figure it out. He's not having like a great week. He's T31 after three rounds. But just look at these tee to green numbers. Look at these ball striking numbers. They're all very good. He has three missed cuts and a top five. Val Spar, Val SP Spar, yeah. So you can see he had the one year he he came in fifth and somehow gained 13.6 strokes tee to green, but dropped on the greens. He's never gained on the greens at this course, so that's somewhat worrisome. But if he does end up gaining at the players, that'll be two in a row since he took his two-week hiatus after just an abysmal start to the year on the greens. But he did have, listen, a sixth place finish, T19, T13. Looks like he's probably going to end up coming like T30-ish unless he has a really nice or really bad Sunday. If he just stays where he's at, minus six, minus seven, minus eight at the players, it'll be a T30, which kind of falls in line with a lot of the different players that we've seen uh, end up winning this event. So Tony's going to be on my short list. This feels like a Tony tournament to win as well. Cantlay is in the field. Min Wu is in the field. Overall, like we have a lot of pretty good players. We'll get to that and guess the odds a little bit later on. But leading the field, Xander, Cantlay, Burns, Harmon, JT, Spieth, Cam Young is playing again. Finau. Then you're into Min Wu, Sung Jay, Nick Taylor, Straka, Keegan Cole, defending champion Taylor Moore, Hadwin. He's won this tournament before. Doug Gim, Aaron Rye, Ryan Fox. Maybe Ryan Fox. Keska the Fox say. He made that hole in one and then missed a cut at the players. Uh, so maybe we don't go to Ryan Fox. It's been a pretty up and down season. Although he did gain four strokes on approach. It's just funny to see how bad his off the tee game has been when that's kind of his weapon. This is when he started to get hot last year was at the players. And I'm going to release a best ball column uh, for major season coming up. And Ryan Fox is one of my favorite kind of like, as Pete would say, the, the scroll down type guys where he's in the first two majors. And when he gets hot, he gets super hot. Uh, and I kind of outline that. And it's mostly on the DP World Tour where he's done most you know, it's where his wins have come from. But you just see him. He has these clusters of like four events in a row where he's great. Then he kind of sucks for like two months. And then he's great for like three tournaments in a row. Then he goes away for like five months and absolutely sucks. But it's just funny to think about it that way of trying to get on someone early and trying to figure that out. Let me load in the Valspar model. I haven't even really even considered it at this point. So let's go to manage models. And oh, Valspar, new for 2022. And I have a Valspar simple. So let's load both those in. And let's get rid of some of the ones that are up there. Bye-bye, players. Bye-bye. Maybe it'll be better next year. Riv, we can get rid of. PGA National, we can get rid of. Driving and putting. Yeah, we can leave that one in there. And we'll get rid of Bay Hill. And we'll update everything for ourselves. Bloop. And then we'll have to reload the page to make sure that everything takes for us. And then uh, we got a stew going here. Valspar, new for 2022. See how, see how it's doing for us here. Past 24 rounds. Uh, and then we'll try to build out a mixed condition model as well. Uh, the model rank of players coming in over the past 24 rounds. You got Xander, Burns, Finau, Burger. How's your burger? Coming in fourth, didn't qualify for the Players' Championship. Poor guy. My guy, Carson Young. Carson Young, three-putted from inside three feet on number 12 or 13. If he had made the cut, I would have won a very substantial amount of money at the Players' Championship. And the moment he missed the cut, my two best lineups were dead. And it was like, well, that's what I really get for being super overweight on Carson Young. Uh, probably not the greatest idea in the world. But now we're back at a course where maybe he can... Do well? Who knows? He does rank fifth in this model. He's going to go down a little bit, I would guess, uh, once the player stats get updated. Sig, Horschel, Hadley, Gim Reaper. Maybe this is the time for Doug Gim. Aaron Rye, are you, are you Jimmy Rye? Who wants to know? He's number 10. Taylor, Novak, Novak Nation kind of sputtered out. A lot of the guys sputtered out the players. I wouldn't worry about that. We saw the, the Paul Casey one, uh, that it really doesn't make that much of a difference. Justin Thomas is actually a lot lower in this than I would have expected. He's number 27 coming in because a lot of the weights, I'll have these in the newsletter, by the way, and you can see them on the screen right now. 
But we have, you know, two, 200 to 225. Justin Thomas has not been all that great in that. Uh, par 5 scoring kind of ditto uh, for him in that way. Justin Thomas, 131st on the PGA Tour over the past 24 rounds and par 3 against the field, 200 to 225 yards. Also, his fairways are way down. Probably should have considered that before I played him and bet him at the Players' Championship. Although his strokes gained off the tee numbers are really good. It's the chipping that really, I mean, the putting was bad for JT. He was fourth in approach after two rounds. So I'm not really too concerned about that. I could see him coming out and curb stomping the field here. But it's going to be hard to trust him knowing that he's going to come in with a very high... Number coming in, bogey avoidance, uh, Hadley, Burns, Pendrith, not not Pendrith so much at the players. I remember Cam Davis in the field. That's going to ruin his numbers for ages. Xander, Badley, Gim, Ryan Palmer, uh, Andrew Putnam, Silverman, Justin Thomas, Taylor Montgomery. This could be a good Montgomery course. The good drives are way down. Who leads in good drives lately? Aaron Rye, Damon, Bryce Garnett. You know, he got a win. He's playing well with the players. Uh, my three weeks in a row for old man Garnett might be a bit too much. Billy Ho. Doing well. Vic Perez, who made a run at the Puerto Rico Open at the very end. Putnam. The opportunities gained are terrible for Putnam. However, the good drives gained are very good. And there's Keith Mitchell. Wow. Maybe this is a week just to go to Keith Mitchell. Uh, He had a very bad Saturday at the players. So maybe that will bury him a little bit. You see good drives gained for Daniel Berger. I want to see the the 24 rounds. How far does that go back? Uh, It goes back to 2022 when he was on fire. How has he been doing? Eh, He had two really good rounds and then two very poor rounds for him. So... I, he's someone that we're going to want to get. I bet him at the at the Honda because I always used to bet him at the Honda. But it's tough with him without seeing like that elite form where you know that his number is going to come in at like probably something pretty decent because he still is a name in this field. I feel like Kevin Doherty's playing all right. Uh, and there's Chan Yu. That's Kevin Yu, by the way. Another guy who, who broke my heart at the players. I'm not afraid to go back to him uh, in this circumstance. No idea how he has been at this course over the years. But you see, it's like top 10 or bust for Kevin Yu at this point. Valspar missed the cut in 2022. All right, so let's load in that other model that I talked about. I I haven't looked at it since. Uh, Valspar, simple. Fairways gained, good drives gained, around the green, opportunities gained, bogey avoidance. Okay, that is super simple. Let's see who's the best in that. Damon, Rye, Novak, Xander, Zach Blair, Glover. I probably don't need fairways and good drives on this. Let me edit this a little bit. Let's just bump down fairways gained, uh, opportunities gained. We're going to throw in some longer irons. We'll go proximity 175 to 200, proximity 200 plus, and throw those two, just because we saw that those two buckets really came out. We're not going to weight them all that highly. Put them at like 5% each. With opportunities gained around the green, we'll bump down a little bit and good drives. Because that does, I mean, we have opportunities gained to capture approach play, like really good approach play. And good drives does factor into that as well. It factors in fairways plus greens and regulation. So let's update it and just see if we have anyone who's a little bit better. Okay, so Damon still stays in first place after 24 rounds. Aaron Rye, number two, Keith Mitchell. So Keith Mitchell's looking like a bet here. Uh, He's been playing a ton of golf, but let's go to Keith Mitchell. He's been playing some relatively good golf, too. This would be six weeks in a row for Keith Mitchell, or maybe even more. Let's see. Actually, no, he wasn't at Bay Hill. Was he? Was he at Bay Hill? I guess he wasn't. Look at these approach numbers. Look at these off the tee numbers. Like, this is kind of like the Taylor Moore template. The around the green is, is, is not doing us any favors here. He's dropped in five straight. So if he needs to get up there in bogey avoidance, he lost 12 strokes putting at this event in 2021. That is, that's got to be some sort of record. I know he's got a hockey record. He's the only guy ever to take off his skate and try to stab someone. But 12 strokes putting? Boy, that's a lot. He gained 8.5 in 2017 when he played here as well. But the off the tee and approach has been really good. Uh, the off the tee was good that year. The approach was good that year. And he broke even around the greens at the Valspar. So you would hope that he can get it together or just hit so many greens in regulation that he doesn't have to chip all that much. You would kind of want someone who's a bit more balanced in all three facets of tee to green. But I like what I'm seeing from Killa Keith here. Maybe time to to jump on it. <laughs> Jump on it. Keith Mitchell. Jump on it. Cam Young. All right. He rates out pretty well. Collie. I mean, I, how has Collie played here? I've liked Collie so far. I mean, he made that little mini run at Honda and then fell back. I mean, the approach play was really good at Phoenix. This will be his third start back. He actually gained strokes putting. He's been gaining off the team. I mean, that was kind of his... 
he actually seems to be better off the tee now than he was in his heyday. And if the approach can come back for him, how has he played this course? Valspa, not well. Valero might be where we want to go. Texas guy, so maybe we go Bud Colley once we get back to Texas. Gim still rates out really, really well. So does Novak. So does the Glove. There's Finau. He's number 15. Rogers is 17. Akshay is 19. There's Pendrith. He's 21. Again, these will all update. Vic Perez actually coming in in fifth. Very good at good drives, opportunities gain. I mean, that's kind of part and parcel. Can't can't chip to save his life. So that's somewhat problematic. I mean, that's where Carson Young is going to get got. That's where he got at the players. Every time he didn't hit a green in regulation, he was proper fucked. And it was not even close. Like, dude cannot chip to save his life. So these around the green numbers I've made pretty penal. And they are bumping down some guys that are pretty bad. The best... The best of the worst guys around the green because they're so good at everything else is Mitchell, is Burns, Cam Young, and Tony Finau. Um, but you just hope that they hit all the greens in regulation. Who is the best around the green player right now? And does that correlate with bogey avoidance? It's S.H. Kim who sucks at bogey avoidance but is great around the green. That's really bizarre to me. Badley's good in both. Collie is really good in both. But again, those stats come from way back. Stumanji Sink, Xander... I mean, if Xander wins the players, I mean, he'll probably end up withdrawing from this tournament, just like Tom Kim did. Tom Kidd obviously withdrew from the players. He's supposed to be in this field. However, he is not. He has already pulled out. Could this be a Bo Hostler track? Good drives up there. Around the green, up there. Bogey avoidance, up there. We know he can putt when the time comes. What are his numbers looking like? And ditto with Mav McNeely. Obviously, he's having a good run at the players through three rounds. But we'll see how, A, he's done. I mean, he's putting up some decent performances despite losing strokes on approach every single week. But if you can drive, chip, and putt well enough, you can kind of get yourself through. He's played this once. That was last year. And he's almost the same template as he is putting up so far this year. He was T36, but gained off the tee, around the green, and putting, and lost strokes on approach. Maybe someday. He's like Min Woo Lee in a weird way. Maybe Min Woo is a guy to look at here. Because driving, if you can just get lucky with the approaches, maybe his like long approach play is a little bit better. Who's this I'm looking at here? Beautiful Bo Hosla. I don't remember if he made the cut or not. I don't think that he did. But the off the tee has been good. The approach has been spotty, but it hasn't been horrible. The around the green is always good. And there's been far more better putting weeks than bad putting weeks. Valspar, miscut. T39, miscut, miscut, miscut. So no great history to speak of, but your T to green wise, he's showing a little bit like we saw with one of those former winners. If we're trying to find a former, like trying to find the winner of this event, uh, Doug Gim is probably, you know, your, I don't want to say your best bet, but he'll probably rate out the best when we start kind of digging into some of this stuff. See, on POA, he puts a little bit better. These will be designated as POA greens. T to green, he's been amazing. The results have been amazing. Can't recall what he's been up to. Never really, uh, nothing much. T27 at Valspar, miscut at Valspar. Can't figure out these greens, but it does appear like he's putting a little bit better than he normally does. I mean, he's had some real rough goes on the greens throughout the course of his career, but maybe it's the time for the Gim Reaper. I'd love to see Gim and Gim end up winning. I want to be there when Gim wins, so... I mean, not there physically, there with like a bet on him after years of betting him. So I'm going to add him with Keith Mitchell to the short list at the moment. Uh, Who's this? Min Woo? So Min Woo, back-to-back good approach weeks. It's funny that his around the green game has been so bad when that's sort of part and parcel of what he's supposed to be doing well. Off the tee, we know he's going to be good. Putting-wise, he should be a lot better. You know, Maybe he had so many spikes last year, and that's really weighing in our minds that he's this great putter, but he has not been good so far this year. He did drain that like giant one on 17 uh, at the players. I mean, we can go take a look at the players. You can always go back and take a look of everything that's in real time. I have that pulled up. Uh, if we just go to the players championship, we can take a look at how some of the players are doing so far this week. And we go to the live stats option. That is at the top and take a look at old Minwoo. He went backwards on Saturday. That I recall. So yeah, the chipping has been good. The putting has not been good. But if we go to round two, and we go to Minwoo. Let's see how much that was going to be. Yeah, he ended up gaining marginally. So not great on that. And if we just stick to all rounds once again, we can take a look. Minwoo, yeah, minus 5.7 on approach, gaining hugely off the tee. Hopefully, uh, you know, if you're going to bet on Minwoo, if you get a really good number, the key would be to obviously... Just hope and pray that it's one of those good approach weeks and everything else comes along with it like it did at PGA National, but this time he can get up over the hump. Strokes gained approach uh, of guys that probably will be in the field. Hoagie, Ryan Moore, Brian Harmon, 
Cam Young uh, are up there. Oh, good. Maybe Xander and Wyndham Clark can blow it on 16 because that's where they're at right now as I'm doing this. Hubbard, uh, Bezaden Hout uh, has a fantastic strokes gained approach right now, as does CT Pan and Cam Young. Nasty Nate Lashley, Hideki. If Hideki can only putt, man, he'd be doing so great in this term. He's T9. He's doing well. Uh, Taylor's having a rough go today. A lot of that is around the green stuff, uh, but he is the approach and putting has been well, and I think he has a top 10 at the Valspar in his career. And we know Canadian Adam Hadwin has won this event before. He already has a win on the area. Let's see, at T10 at Valspar, 70th, miscut, 24th, miscut, 62nd, miscut, 24th. Nick Taylor's been around an awful long time. Generally gains on approach. You do worry about his wonky, his leaky driver, as we're, we'll call it at this play. So maybe he can club down and it won't be that big of a deal. Um, just trying to find some other guys who are up there in approach. Ekrot, Thigala, uh, they're not playing. Aaron Rye is up there. Dude can't putt. This we know. Neesmith, uh, Tita Green doing great. 5.7. Killa Keith, you know, 3.1. Losing everywhere else. Dropped almost four strokes on approach through three rounds. But nice to see that the approach is up there again for him. Zach Blair? I mean, we can get back on Zach Blair. Did, is this the place where he popped up last year? He popped up, like, inside the top 10 somewhere. I know, that was at Wells Fargo somehow. Valspar. He was T10 here last year, yeah. And putted the lights out, drove it straight, and chip, chipped as well as you could possibly chip. So that's what we're looking at right now uh, for the guys that were playing well this week. Uh, then Actually, the other thing that we can do before I jump out of here and take a look at the live stats, I just want to take a look at some of the guys who missed the cut and see how they ended up doing and see if there was anyone who has, like, hidden stats. Thomas, 4.7 strokes on approach, approach couldn't do anything else. Was there anyone else? He's really the only one with like a, a spike up in a, any of this stuff. David Skins was good, T to green. Most of that was driving related. Tyson Alexander and Alex Smalley, both pretty good on approach. Grayson Sig, really good on approach. Terrible off the tee. But he rated really out really well on that model that we ran earlier. Hayden Buckley gained strokes ball striking, as did Akshay. Akshay couldn't chip. Akshay couldn't putt. That's not new for Akshay. Maybe he could get dialed in at a course like this. He's sort of like the the lesser version of what Kevin Yu has been so far this year in terms of he's going to have a really good performance or he's going to be absolute shit. And there's Dylon Wu. How is he losing so many strokes off the tee? He must have went in the water a few times because he's someone who's normally exceptionally accurate off the tee. We'll see if he's in the field. I really liked him at Colonial a year ago, and he kind of did well, but not as well as you would want. Let's see. Dylon Wu! Yeah, fairways gain, 25th, good drives, not great. So he's not having a fantastic year, although we see that the approach has been really good for him. Uh, two of the past three weeks, and he's going to be right around four right now at the Players' Championship. Gained a bunch at Sony as well. Uh, last year, the approach had been pretty dialed in. You just need him to hit the fairways he has to hit. It's, now I need to see if CT Pan's in the field. Is it time to get sucked back into CT Pan? The Panama? You Panamaniacs out there getting sucked back into CT Pan? Doesn't feel like he's in the field. No, he's not. Poor guy. Poor Pan. Let's see. Let's let's scroll down in case I'm just spell. I know his name is, I mean, it's not all weird. This is his actual name. Uh, but I always forget how to spell Shen, Shen, CT is what I want to look at. Just like CT from the challenge in tr the traitors, you need CT on the PGA Tour. Maybe he can come through for us. Um, scrambling wise around the green wise, anyone else that kind of sticks out? Martin Trainer. What a run for Martin Trainer. He went from the PGA Tour. He just played in, I think it was Singapore, Macau this week on the Asian tour. He was inside the top 10. Now he's going to fly back to play in Florida again. This guy's trying to have his cake and eat it too. Trying to get in the live tour, trying to keep his PGA tour card. What hustle from party. Martin Trenet, who now identifies as he is from France. Although for years he was American, but now he is France. Maybe he's trying to get on the Ryder Cup team. Bad look. Maybe he's trying to get on the Olympic team for France uh, before everyone on France like actually started to be good. All right, so I think that's enough of that. Let's get to the odds for the Valspar Championship. Let's try to guess them. Now, a lot of this will have to do with how Xander or Harmon end up finishing at the players. If Harmon wins, his odds are going to be higher. If Xander wins, his odds are going to be higher. He's currently winning as I am recording this, whether or not he holds on. I mean, 
he's Gagatha Christie out here on a lot of these big end events. So will he hold on? I mean, you got Wyndham Clark who wins big events. Brian Harmon who just won the Open Championship on his heels. I'd kind of, I mean, I want to see Harmon win for me personally, but it'd be nice to see Xander get a big win. He'd kind of have, you know, WGC, he has the Tour Championship, get him a player's. He kind of has like the, the the mini circuit of everything that's below a major championship going into it. But we can guess the odds. I'm guessing that Xander is going to be the favorite coming into this tournament. I have him at 10 to 1. Cantlay at 12. Sam Burns at 14. He is a two-time defending champion. We'll see how he finishes. At, not defending champion. He won this two years in a row. Finished T6 a year ago. Put on a show early on Saturday at the players too. We'll see where he finishes up. Brian Harmon and Justin Thomas, both at 18 to one cam young and Jordan Spieth, both at 22 to one Tony Finau, 25 to one, maybe catch a 30. If it's 30, 28 to 30 on, on top five, Tony bet him to win, not top five. I'll bet him to win. And then I'll be pissed when he comes to E4. And I didn't bet him to finish inside the top 10 men. Woo Lee 35 to one, along with Sung Jay, Nick Taylor and Straka, both, 40 to 1. Keegan and Cole, both 45 to 1, along with Bo Hostler. Uh, the books just like Bo Hostler. They always seem to overvalue him in that sense for a guy who's never won. I'll put him at 45 to 1 as well. After that, defending champ Taylor Moore at 50 to 1, along with Sebez. Glover at 55. Former winner Adam Hadwin at 60. I have Doug Gim in my initial at 60. He's probably going to be like 45. Oh, dagger. Dagger to the heart on Doug Gimmett, 45 to 1 in a full field event. If he's 60, I'll probably bet him. Aaron Rye, Ryan Fox, Adam Shank, who was the runner up last year, I have all at 65 to 1. Join Underdog Fantasy if you have not. I gave it a 100 to 1 play on Saturday. It did not win. But we were five inches away from hitting the 27 to 1 insured play on it when Rory just misses Eagle Putt on 16. We had Hoagie plus Rory plus Cam Young, who had a real bad day on Saturday at TPC Sawgrass, did not make an eagle. They had eagles or more. Hoagie made his, and Rory came that close, that close uh, to dropping his on 16. Had a few chances. He just did not play great golf. Uh, Would have been nice to hit. But Underdog Fantasy, Code Mayo, the link is down in the description. Again, if you're doing it before Sunday night, I'm giving away the $5,000 on Sunday night on the NCAA Tournament Bracket Pick'em Show. So get yourself in the draw. If you're not already doing that, you need the underdog handle to get into it already. Monthly plan at Fantasy National right now. FantasyNational.com slash Mayo gets you 20% off and brings you into Heritage Week. So you get the Masters and every other tournament that's up there. And if our app ever gets approved in the Apple Store, you can get put on the list to test that out. And frankly, honestly... If I didn't, you know, co-own Fantasy National and then sell it and still be involved in it, I would pay the membership fee just to have this app. I've been very involved in the development of the app, so maybe I'm not objective about it, but I have, I mean, I'm not building it per se, but all of my notes, you know, it was my idea to create this app because I wanted a better app for people who want to follow golf. And that's what this is going to be. And you're really going to like it once it's actually able to be in your hands. So fantasynational.com slash mayo will get you on the waiting list to get into that. Sub to the channel, rate and review the podcast, download it too while you're here, and smash the like. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Pat Mayo. I'll see you next time. Experience! Experience!